Well, good evening, friends, and welcome to the Help Desk. Uh, my name is Adam Hildebrand. I'm the senior pastor at First United Methodist Church of Lawrenceville, and this uh, show is really designed to help us deal with different issues in our lives, and, and the idea is we just want to be a help to you. And so that's, that's what we're all about. We would love for you to join in the conversation. Please feel free to ask any questions you have or uh, leave some thoughts so that we can continue this conversation uh, as we go forward from here. But uh, with everything going on in the world right now, uh, with, uh, with just some of the, the protests and the, uh, the, the racial divide that's really been uh, shown in our world, I asked my friend uh, Trenton to come on the show tonight and to uh, to be a help to us, uh, to help us understand some of the things that we might not understand, to help us see the world a little bit differently. So uh, Trenton is the one of the associate pastors at Grayson United Methodist Church, and so right down the road from us here in Lawrenceville. So he he understands a little bit about our community and uh, understands some of the uh, some of the the things that are happening, some of the pain points. Uh, but also some of the joys and, and some of the great stories. And uh, I've had the, the privilege to get to know Trenton over the last uh, month or so, and just uh, just having some conversations around some completely different things and, and led us to this moment. So uh, I'm excited to see what God continues to do uh, as we continue to build a relationship, but as you get to know him as well, I think you're, you're going to love him. And uh, if you know Laura Drake, you know, Laura, like Laura Drake loves Trenton and, uh, Laura Drake talks directly to Jesus. Um, yeah. So I, yeah. I, as soon as Laura Drake said, you're the best, I knew you were the best. So uh, Trent, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, tell sure. us kind of where you're from, what your, uh, uh, what your background is, and how you find yourself in this moment talking to, uh, to, to this bald-headed preacher. Oh, man. Well, uh, thank you again for inviting me, and I hope um, this conversation is just edifying to um, the people in your church and anyone else who's watching. Um, we have a lot of connections, honestly, to Lawrenceville. I'll tell you about one immediate one at the end, but uh, one of my TAs at Emory, I went to Candler School of Theology, was Andrew Chapel. There you um, go. So, you know, you got uh, Davis Chapel's son, and um, obviously you'll work with the co-op. Um, so um, there's a lot of connections there. And then also Alan Hoskin. Um, me and him have been having a ton of conversation, too. So uh, Lawrenceville is a, a, a lovely place um, from the people I've met. So I pray that, like I said, that this is a good conversation. But um, yeah, so, you know, I'm not originally from Georgia. I grew up. Uh, really? Um, I couldn't tell by your accent. Like it just... <laughs> I've been here a little while now. Uh, I was born <laughs> and raised in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, so I, I'm a big, you know, Packer, Brewer uh, fan, Bucks fan. Um, and I, you know, I grew up, um, in the city of Milwaukee, which if you ever did any research, you would find out it's one of the, the worst places to be an African-American male. Um, uh, we have a huge, uh, jail, um, population, um, not a lot of jobs. So I grew up in that environment, but I, my parents put us, put me and my siblings in, uh, predominantly white school. So, Matter of fact, uh, any Auburn fans in the place, uh, uh, I played basketball with uh, Bruce Pearl's son, Steve Pearl. Um, so we, we were on the same high school basketball team. Um, I wasn't as good as him, wasn't that good at all. But um, so so that was the context that I grew up in. I grew up in this, you know, I went to school in the suburbs, but I lived in the city. Um, so I was always in these diverse environments. And when I thought about college, um, I had opportunities to go to Marquette University, downtown Milwaukee, uh, Madison, where my parents went. Uh, I, I liked DePaul, which is in Chicago. But all of those environments reminded me of my high school, my, my middle school, my elementary experience, where I was one of the few black people who was smart. And that kind of labeled me, uh, kind of labeled me as the smart black kid. And you know, that I talked white, you know, all, a, a lot of those things that we hear tossed around a lot, even now. So I wanted a different experience and um, I chose to go to Morehouse College, which is in downtown Atlanta, just about. And uh, that that's how my, I eventually got here to the South and got somewhat of an accent and uh, got a call to ministry there. 
Um, so, you know, the process to become Methodist is a whole nother story. <laughs> um, but I think that trope describes my life, right? You know, that I'm living in these diverse environments. And so that's kind of the, the church, the, the ministry that I kind of want to pastor in, um, just these, these different um, places that help bring people together. Um, yeah. So that's a little bit about me. <laughs> well, uh, unpack that a little bit more. You know, you, you lived in the city and so you, but you went to a suburban white school. Yeah. What, I mean, talk a little bit more about that experience. What are, uh, how does, how does that happen so frequently and, and what's that experience like? Well, my, well, my parents, my parents divorced when I was two, but they were, they were adamant about us being successful. So, you know, from the beginning, they, they, they made us say, look, your parents are college graduates. You guys have no excuse to not do well. Um, I don't care what anyone says about you, you know, you're black, but that that's not an excuse to not do well. Um, so we had to have these conversations about race really early. Um, and we had to learn to adapt, uh, to different people, um, and not, uh, use being black as a reason not to, um, excel. So, um, for me, uh, and I don't know if this is answering your question well, but I think, Knowing and being aware of, of my race and, and how um, I, I knew to expect or, you know, I was prepared for certain things that happened. You know, like I said, you know, it's somewhat it's somewhat bad in a way, you know, to tell, oh, you have a lot of potential. You know, you're a smart black kid. Um, it, it's kind of damaging in a way because you're, you're automatically saying, well, are all kids that are black smart? You know, so you're you're already kind of being aware of the difference between you and some of your peers. Um, like it's a surprise when I do well um, or like even now, like I, I have a I don't have a, a bad vocabulary. Um, so as a kid, you know, even my friends who were black, who, who didn't talk like me, you know, they called me a square or they called me, you know, um, an Oreo. Uh, which is a, uh, you guys have an Oreo, you know, black on the outside, white on the inside. So yeah, I'm, I would be, I think the difference is, is I, I was aware of my race and how that impacted the worlds and the the systems that I moved in um, regularly. Um, and so you, you just kind of, you prepare for that, but it does make life different. It makes yeah. life different. And, and I think that's an important distinction, just the awareness of, of, of race. Um, you know, most of, uh, most of the, the cultural norms that we see tend towards, uh, towards the white community. And, and so a, a lot of times when we, uh, when we cross over those two things, they're, they're, you know, that's where we wrestle with these questions about what's normative and how do we, um, you know, I guess, how do we begin to, to break down some of those walls and to understand each other better? Yeah. I mean, I, I still remember, uh, you know, someone was posting something like, when was the first time you, you were really, really aware of your race? Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget my, my second grade teacher, uh, won the children of the, uh, the teacher of the year award. Um, and she invited me, she wanted to take me, uh, to the Betty Byrne Children Museum. And she picked me up. She chose to pick me up. And I was I was frightened. I was like, you know, I remember praying like, Lord, don't let anything happen to her. You know, I'm coming to get me um, because I know she doesn't look like people in my neighborhood. Um, something could happen. Um, and Adam, I tell you, she went and got gas near my house. Like she picked me up and then she went and got gas. And I, as a kid, I remember sitting in the back like, oh, Lord, you know, don't let her get robbed. Don't let her, you know. And, and so I, you become I mean, at the in second grade or seven. So I became, I was consciously aware, you know, at that age of this, this, this disparity um, that's happening um, in America where I live. So um, you're there, there is a difference. Um, but just because it's a difference doesn't mean it isn't true. And, and I think that's a, a really, really helpful thing um, as we think about what it means to be Christian in America, what it means to be 
um, brothers and sisters in Christ, um, perspective determines uh, what we see. Um, so just because you don't see it doesn't mean it isn't true. You know, uh, most of our parishioners, they sit in the same pew or the same seat every Sunday. Right. Not, not right now. Right now. They, they sit. Yeah, on, well, right now they sit on the corona, couch. Pre Corona. Right. And, you know, they'll say, well, you know, they'll see a friend. Hey, where were you? And they say, oh, I was in the same service as you. But they didn't see each other, you know, and it's because they stay in the same seat. And and so we we regularly move in the same directions every day. Um, so a lot of things happen that we don't see. Um, and so that doesn't invalidate my experience because it's different than yours. Yeah. yeah. And and I think that's that's been the best thing just in in these conversations that you and I have been able to have is uh, for me to hear from just a completely different experience point, just to hear your story and to hear who you are. And those relationships are so incredibly powerful. Um, it, it allows me to hear you and you to hear me and, and for us to, to unpack some of these lenses that I think uh, we all kind of inherit. Yes. And what you were talking about is this concept of uh, really systemic racism that, you know, it, as white people, we get really scared when we hear the word racism. Yeah. Um, you know, we get a little, everybody gets uncomfortable. Uh, so everybody who's watching now is, is now uncomfortable. Um, but, but that there's this, uh, there's this deeper layer to this that's not outward, you know, KKK, uh, type of, of racism that exists in the world. And, and unless we hear people's stories, we don't understand those systems, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think what's helpful and me and you talk about this often when we've talked about this is this isn't foreign to the biblical text. Um, and the biblical text Gentiles are the, the ones who, don't deserve, you know, there, there was this, there's this form of system that kept Jews in power, you know, and, and we saw that really exacerbated with the Pharisees, right? Um, and so, so what do we see Jesus doing, you know? Um, the, the reason, uh, a really, really touching reason why uh, this is so important for us to see it through this lens is that, you know, when Jesus is healing on the Sabbath, I mean, Jesus could have healed on any other day of the week, um, but he's healing on the Sabbath. Why? And, and why were they so upset? Why were the Pharisees so upset that he would choose to to heal and, and, and perform miracles on the Sabbath? Well, it was to address the system um, that was happening uh, in, in Judaism um, at the time that, you know, and they're supposed to, you know, if you read the Old Testament, they're supposed to care for the foreign, care for the poor, because they once were, you know, um, they once were, but they weren't at the time. They, they valued their money. Um, they valued their system. They valued staying in power. They valued keeping their comfort, their privilege, um, their rights to, to have the way they think that they wanted. So Jesus heals on the Sabbath, um, especially people who were different, the Samaritan woman, the yeah. uh, Zacchaeus, you know, the tax collectors, you know, he, the reason why we don't know some of their names is to highlight the cultural <laughs> backdrop that was happening in the time um, that Jesus was, he says, no more system. He, he offers the kingdom, you know, the, the kingdom. Say that again. Cause I, you said that to me the other day and I was like, like yeah, yeah. Uh, so he, you know, Jesus didn't come to, to be on the left or the right of anything. Jesus came to take over. He came to, to repent and Mark Mark's gospel. You know, Mark 1 15, you know, uh, repent The the kingdom is here. You know, um, it, it's here. It's near. It's right here. Um, this new place where there's a king and he's benevolent. He's good. Um, but there's no marginalization. Um, but there's also no hierarchy either. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so that that's the world that Jesus comes in and then offers to us. And then we live that out. Um, the kingdom of God is wherever God's rule is evident. So if God's rule is evident in our life or in, you know, in our churches, in our homes, in our buildings, um, then people begin to see and say, oh, well, it could be true out there in the world. But in here, 
you know, no, you're my brother. You know, you're my sister. You're you're one. You're we're we're one together. So that's the world that Jesus. It's not systemic racism. We make it. If it was the other way around, it would be the same thing. It's a it's an issue of justice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of issues of justice, talk to me one, how you're doing right now in this moment. And then yeah. kind of, if you can unpack a little bit of, of the protests, unpack a little bit of the hurt from, uh, from the deaths that have taken place, from the murders that have taken place. Um, and, and just, just talk me through that. Sure. Um, and, and so this is something that's really helpful. It's a, it's a cultural difference. Um, and so remember, like I said, perspective is what we see. Um, so when something happens, our white brothers and sisters, our Caucasian brothers and sisters, if something happens, you guys communicate probably on a level two or the facts. Do you know that person? That that de- that determines an emotional response. Like if you know the person, you're hurt, you know, but if you don't know the person, you might feel a certain way, but it's not like it may not ruin your day so much for black people, uh, for people of color. We're much more communal. We're not individualistic. So when we see something happen, good or bad, to someone who looks like us, it's like it happened to us. It's like it it's like if I if even today, if I if I leave my house and I don't have my wallet on me, my wife will call me if she sees it and she will be upset. Trenton, come back, get your wallet Um, because we 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 feel we're emotive. It's it's like it, it was us. So when we see. Um, George Floyd, um, and, w- and when we see Breonna Taylor, and, and when we see Ahmaud Arbery down here in Brunswick, it's like, man, that could be me, that could be my son, or that could be my brother or my cousin. Um, and so we automatically, you know, it's not necessarily a right or wrong thing, it's just what's true. We automatically go to a force. So yeah, it, it's it's difficult, not just seeing that he died at the hands of someone who was supposed to serve and protect, but that the the highlighted system around um, what's happening was that there was three other officers there Mm -hmm. um, who heard, I I can't breathe, I'm struggling and didn't do anything. Uh, And so um, I think that's where, you know, it's the trauma, you know, ministering in that. So yeah, it hurts. Um, And pretty much, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to reconcile and it creates a fear. It creates a fear um, that that can happen to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I like. I'm yeah. Processing through all that, that, that just, you know, watching that tape, even, even for me was, was difficult and just gut wrenching. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, at, at the same time, I know I've never, I, if I forget my wallet, I forget my wallet. Like I, yeah. I don't have that, that background, that, that piece that, that I'm carrying with me. So yeah. That's so, that's so, so good. Um, but, but I also want to say, Adam, you know, and, and, you know, you know, you know, sorry if I get you in trouble with your, no, 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 go ahead. Get, get me but in trouble. I, I like that. You, you are feeling different because we have connected mm-hmm. because we have connected um, you, you're beginning to see and identify with what I see. And, and, and isn't that Jesus, right? <laughs> Jesus was fully God, but he, but he comes, he comes down and he lives, he becomes man. He yeah. identifies with our pain. So that's why he can relate. Um, and if we get to the point where we bring each other near, we gather and we mm. share our pain, um, now you're you're in a way, Adam, you're wrecked. You know, you're going to see it yeah. somewhere. And it's like, man, in a way, it, it is like it happened to me. And, yeah. and you're going to be able to you're you won't be able to unsee it. You know, right. um, the system behind it and all that. I love that. I love that. Tell, tell me a little bit. Just talk to me about kind of the some of the protests that are happening. Um, sure. Help me to differentiate between kind of the protests and the, and the looting. Sure. Um, and, and this is, this is important. Um, um, if you, uh, there's a, there's a strong contingent of people who want the protest to be people that are black or that are brown or, um, that are people of color. Um, 
the the emotions behind a lot of it is stems from a lot of things that don't even have anything to do with George Floyd. I mean, we've been in a pandemic, you know, so we've been hibernating for a long time. Um, then we also don't know. In a lot of cases, some people think it's a hoax. You know, I mean, I don't think I, I can't imagine how you could see 110,000 people dying as a hoax. But, you know, because it hasn't happened so much or, you know, some people in some people's minds, you know, they're mad, you know, and then, you know, some corporations got more money than than people did, you know, and so people are afraid for their jobs and their future. Um, so all these things have contributed to this fear uh, that has definitely heightened the people's emotions. Um, but then at the same time, you have people who uh, are rioting and looting and, and most most people, most black people are not for that. Most, most, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I don't speak for every black person. Um, but you know, the, the problem that we see is that when, when people are protesting, um, it's like the responsibility to respond or do something, it still falls on the shoulders of the oppressed and not our brothers and mm. sisters who are a part of it and, and say, man, this is wrong. You know, yeah. uh, you know, that, you know, we, we didn't create racism in America, you know, so why is it our responsibility to fix it? You know, only, you know, uh, we want to fix it, uh, but we need a partner. We need, we need to dance. We, we need to have a, have a way of doing this together. Um, and so I think that's when the protests actually, you see all of that kind of mixed together and it's like, wait, well, what's happening here? Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff happening. A lot of people have different motives. Um, but uh, George Floyd, he, his his brother came out on record, you know, would not be for it. Uh, yeah. Many, uh, Keisha Lance Bottom, you know, our uh, mayor of Atlanta, you know, mm -hmm. was not for the looting and the rioting. So there's a lot of mixed emotions, but you got to imagine it's still stemming from over 400 years of not being seen. Uh, yeah. And so uh, that in a nutshell, shows some of the, what's happening with the protests. So uh, just to change gears here, I got a question from uh, my friend Patrick says, uh, how do you approach individuals to deny that they benefit from systemic race, racism? Sure. Uh, how do you educate those who may not want to listen? And I think that's, that's kind of what we're, we're, we're dancing around that here. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, uh, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, you, you got to, uh, we can't change our own hearts, right? Um, nobody, you know, can can force or inflict change. Uh, when Martin Luther King fought desperately and hard for the voting rights to change, um, a big contingent rose up because black people still didn't get respect in America, you know, even though we could vote. Um, and so people are really mad. And he says, well, we can't legislate change of, of, of heart. So when someone says, well, I don't benefit from systemic racism, you know, you can come up with all the creative ways to demonstrate it or show it. Um, that person, we have to get to the point where, and Adam knows this, sometimes people don't want to see it. I mean, that can be true about anything scripturally. You know, I, I can tell you, hey, God loves you. And if I don't want to believe that, I can actually say I won't believe it and I can use bias or I can use life experiences to confirm what I don't want to believe already, you know, say, Oh, it will rained on me today. God doesn't love me. You know? So the best thing I say, Patrick is if you're a friend of his, or if you're in his life, pray for him, uh, pray for his heart to be pliable and no, no different than when we pray for people to come to Christ and be saved. Um, this is something that you have to at least be pliable just like in everything spiritual um, to, to accept and, and even investigate. Um, and that's what happens when we're preaching and we're hoping someone comes to faith. You're sowing a seed yeah. or, or you're watering a seed in his life. Um, so, you know, God is over, God is over the increase. God is over the change of heart. So if it's someone you love, um, pray for him, continue to walk with him. Um, but, but trust that God will, it, cause it's true. It's, it's in the Bible. It's, it's, it's God's heart. Um, believe that he'll one day come and investigate on his own and see for himself. Well, I think, it, I mean, there's a lot of layers to, to that one question and, and to what you just said in terms of uh, 
you, you recommended a book to me, you know, six weeks ago called White Fragility. And I, I yeah. read the book and it, you know, it forced me to ask some questions of myself that that I had never asked or that I had, had dismissed. Um, you know, we could look at our lives and I could go, oh, you know, uh, uh, Trenton came from a, a divorce home. I came from a divorce home. We, we've had the exact same. Yeah, the same. Yeah. Um, but that's not true. I mean, yeah. uh, the, the high school that I, I grew up in was, uh, you know, I mean, predominantly Caucasian. Uh, I was the, uh, I was the norm. Um, and so there, there are these things that we just don't even notice. And I, I think, again, hearing each other's stories and making these connections is really uh, what it's all about. Um, and, and I know I have to leave, but, uh, yeah. you know, I think, Adam, that's a perfect segue into the story. Yes, that, please that tell the story. I love this. this uh, connects me to Lawrenceville. So two years ago, um, it's around the time where pastors are moving. Um, and so in May, uh, my, our, we, me and my wife and I, we still had our house in Atlanta, but we were four months pregnant. Um, so we were going to rent our house out and we were going to rent up here in Grayson. Well, you know, Grayson is small, um, not a lot of places, and it's somewhat expensive. Um, so we began to pray. I, I said, Lord, I know you called us here. We get an email uh, the next day uh, from our, our church secretary, and she says there's uh, a family who has a house that they want to rent to a pastor that that family ended up being Jim and Sheila Selsby. Um, and so Me- members brought, of first United Methodist church of Lawrenceville. Let's just, let's just, yeah. Make sure yeah. We, yeah. Uh, Jim and Sheila. We got to get that plug in whenever we can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they, uh, you guys had an associate Jared, um, who had dogs and cats and Jimmy may, um, no dogs and cats. That was her. We don't have any. So, um, but there was no pictures. We had no idea what we were seeing um, before we got out here. Um, we drove out here and, you know, this is, we're not in Grayson often, you know, uh, so it's, it's, it's country, you know, we're not familiar with it. Um, and then we drive up on the Selsby property and it's, it's beautiful, obviously. But the first question I ask before we get into the house is, do they know we're black? Um, and will that be something that makes us out of it? And you got to imagine, I got a pregnant wife and, and my wife is beautiful. She doesn't want to fix her upper. Uh, you know, she she's concerned about getting the house ready for our daughter. Uh, so we get to the door and I meet Jim and Sheila. And the first thing out of Jim and Sheila's mouth is we know you. Their son, Robert, um, got married. And a guy in his wedding, his name is Jeff Rogers, Reverend Jeff Rogers. And Jeff and I went to Candler School of Theology together. And we were in a Methodist class together. We prayed for each other. And so they did research on me already. And uh, Jeff told Jim and Sheila that, hey, I trust Trenton. I trust him. So they didn't know I had these emotions as a black man, which is typical for me. Uh, I questioned, you know, if people would receive me, but it was important that Jim and Sheila, you know, they, they didn't look, they looked beyond my race. You know, they, they weren't evaluating me or uh, basing uh, an opinion off of me because of how they may have the media or how experiences may have shaped them about who black people are. They saw me as a brother in Christ. They trusted another brother's rep. My, they trusted my reputation from Jeff, and and I, I absolutely love them. We, we've talked about this already. Um, they 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 were lifesavers for us, um, and so that is exactly what you can do in this season. That's so important. Um, listen to people's stories, believe them, um, discern for yourself, discern obviously, but believe them, um, and then empower. You know, um, connect. Um, defend, you know, when people say things that aren't true because of your experience. So powerful story from first Lawrenceville. Yeah. Not even this. Yeah. Trenton, you got like, I know you got to jump off, but you got two more minutes for me. Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
we, we talked about this earlier, this, this phrase that we hear a lot. And I was, I, I went down to the protests the other day in Lawrenceville and, and saw this, heard this, this phrase, black lives matter. Yeah. Unpack that a little bit for me. Um, so this movement stems from um, a lot of the reporting um, that we were actually filming. Uh, people were filming police brutality to black people um, or uh, one person, the same charge gets a higher uh, sentence than someone who's not black. Um, so that is what that movement emerged out of, that these things weren't just happening for the first time, but for the first time they were actually being viewed, they were actually being recorded, and nothing was still being done to change some of these things that were happening. I care just like everyone else about impartial justice. I, I, want, I want impartiality. I want if I do something wrong, I'm going to get the same charge as Adam. Everybody wants that. But Black Lives Matter, uh, from my understanding, comes out of this this hope and belief that if I put a light and attention to our, our culture about, hey, when this happens, you know, we're treated unjustly. Um, and, and that was it. Uh, but what ended up happening was it was spun to make people believe that we were saying only black lives matter, you know, that only black lives are important. Um, and that's never been the case. We're just saying it matters to us. It, it should matter to you that uh, there's a something in our justice system, something that does not promote impartiality where, you know, if something happens to us, we're always questioned or, you know, th that's the feelings and sentiments. Um, so when people promote back, well, all lives matter, it's already clear that all lives matter. <laughs> it's already clear. We're yeah. saying black lives matter because that's not actually true. It's not a, a marriage of theology and practice. We have laws that are set up that say that's true, but the practice of those laws or what ends up mm. happening isn't true. And what would we call that? We would call that hypocrisy. Yeah. You say one thing and you do another, that's hypocrisy. So we're saying we're, it's a calling attention mm -hmm. to the hypocrisy. And, and biblically, the, the the scripture that screams out for us, Jesus is hard about this, is Luke 15. It, it's it's Luke 15 because Jesus, when he had 100 sheep, 99 were together, one was away. Do all of his sheep matter? Absolutely. Absolutely. What does he do? He doesn't just say he, ca he keeps the 99 and keeps moving. No, he goes and gets the one. And he's happy. There's joy when he finds it. And, and so, so that's what we're saying. All lives matter. Yes. And that's why black lives do matter. Mm -hmm. Give us impartial justice. Treat us the same way you would treat everyone else. And you say, well, that's true. Well, I would say check, check reports of, of how justice is administered. Check reports about how the, do your own research and discover the truth. of Wage disparity, yes, yes, wealth yes, disparity. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. It, it, yes. All the way down the line. Yeah. Oh. Well, Trenton, thank you so much for your time. I know you got to go lead a Bible study and you've, uh, you've already spent some time with us, but, but would you do the honor of, of praying for all of us sure. uh, in this moment? I'd appreciate that. Sure. Uh, well, Father, we just thank you. Uh, thank you for Adam and thank you for everyone who participated who, or who will hear. Um, Father, we thank you for the kingdom of God. Um, that systems are always imperfect. Systems built and and structured on this earth on this earth because there's a there's a king of this earth, uh, there's a prince of this earth, um, and Satan is not you. Um, but God, you have all power and authority, and you call us to go and make disciples uh, of all nations. Um, and so, God, that means the kingdom of God was meant and created to push back on things that aren't true in the world. Uh, God, help us to hear each other as brothers and evaluate each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and um, identify with one another. Uh, Paul said, uh, I became like a Jew so that I may win Jews. I became like a Greek so that I may w win Greeks. I became like a slave. And, and all he was doing was saying, I, I become like the people I'm trying to minister and reach. Um, and help us have that heart, help help all of us, all of us have that same heart where we become like each other so that we may nourish, edify, encourage, 
and, and promote a unity to the world that reflects heaven on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Trenton, thank you so much for your time. Thank and you. If people have other questions, I'm going to ask them to leave in the comments and maybe you can come back and later and check it out and just uh, let's continue this conversation, man. I, I am so grateful for you. So grateful for your ministry. Grateful for your friendship. Thank you, brother. All right. See you guys. We'll see you. Hey, hey, friends, I, I just want to just spend another moment with you. Um, Trenton is just a gem. I, I really enjoy the, the conversations that we've had, getting to know each other. Uh, if, if, if you look around your friend group and there's not somebody who looks different than you, reach out to somebody, make a new connection, uh, find a new person to have some conversation with. Um, you know, that's where this all begins is us being willing to, uh, to lay our preconceived notions down um, and, and to walk across the street and have a conversation. How are you doing? Tell me your story. Uh, how, can I, how, how can I understand where, where you come from? How, how can I understand where you're coming from? These are powerful questions that I think change our perspective and help us to have a, a bigger picture of that, that kingdom that uh, Trenton was talking about and, and uh, help us to understand who God is and uh, what God is up to in our world. We can be a part, we can be a part uh, of God putting things back together, uh, of, of recreating a new world of justice, of hope, of peace, uh, right here, right here, like in our community, that, that's happening around us. And so I hope you'll be a part of it. I hope you'll continue to pray uh, to that end, uh, to, to read everything you can. I know there's some great documentaries out there on Netflix that people are recommending right now in order to kind of understand some of the tension that, that everyone is grappling with um, in, terms of, in terms of racial reconciliation. We, we need to be informed and we need to listen well. Uh, you know, God made us with two ears and only one mouth. We need to listen twice as much as we talk. And so that's hard coming from a preacher, right? That, that's not exactly what you expect to hear. But I hope you guys will go into your communities, that you'll listen well, that you'll love well, that you'll pray for people, and that you'll hear their stories because their stories matter. They matter to God, so they matter to us. Uh, let's go be a part of the solution. Hope you guys have a great evening, and uh, we will see you online on Sunday morning, uh, either at 9.30 or 11 on, on Facebook. YouTube, we're going to try something a little different this week, uh, just in case you guys are, are worshiping with us. Uh, we're, we're just going to drop those videos so they are on demand. So uh, all of my eight o'clock friends, if you want to have church at eight o'clock, you go. You, you, you click on that YouTube link and you can have church at eight o'clock. Um, if, if you're more of an 11 o'clock person, hey, 11 o'clock, it'll be there. If you're 9.30, it'll be there. If, if you're thinking, I'm going to wait until afternoon. It will be there. Uh, so you can worship with us anytime. And uh, we hope to, uh, to, to see you on Sunday morning uh, in one of our worship experiences. Uh, just again, if you could say thank you to Trenton in the comments. Uh, it's so refreshing to hear uh, honesty and, and perspective like he's bringing. And uh, looking forward to more conversations just like this. We'll see you guys soon.